Hello, friends. Not too long ago, I had a little private survey of some of my friends, and I said to them, do you understand the book of Revelation? One of my closest friends who grew up in the same church that I grew up in said, you know, Rexel, I've studied it all my life and I still don't understand it. Well, that was quite a challenge to me, and so I went home, said to Jack, you know, we really need to do a video on the book of Revelation, or the apocalypse, as the Roman Catholics call it, and unravel the whole thing. Let's make it understandable and relevant to the lives of all of us. And I don't know of anybody who can do that better than Jack Van Impey. He studied prophecy all of his life. And Jack, this is a challenge for you today. It really is, Rick Sella. Today we're just going to hit the highlights of the chapters, and I've I promise you it's going to be exciting. Well, I've also talked to other people who have said, you know, Rexella, that's just a book that's symbolic. You can't take the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse and actually make it literal where we should really believe it. Well, let me just read an article here for you, just a couple of sentences. The last book of the New Testament that is believed to be written by the Apostle John as a biblical drama should be seen as a sweeping metaphor and should not be taken literally. Now, um, I sort of take exception to that because we're going to prove to you today that the Lord does want us to take it literally. Uh, but there have been religious leaders, not just laymen, but religious leaders who've said the same thing. You can't take the book of Revelation literally. So why should we put so much importance on the book of Revelation when religious leaders have even said, throw it out of the Bible, you don't even need it. Why do you think it's so important, Jack? Many religious leaders speak that way simply because so much study time is involved in getting every little verse situated in one's mind and how they fit together. Let me say this right now. Sir Isaac Newton, and he's been proclaimed as one of the greatest scientists of all time by 20th and 21st century scientists, said the day will come just before Christ returns when men will proclaim God's word literally and be opposed because of it. That time has come. First of all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16. Because of it, we have a sure word of prophecy, 2 Peter 1.19, because verse 21 states, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, when we get to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1 says, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not revelations. All these people who are always knocking the book always mispronounce it. They don't even know the correct name of the book. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who wrote it? The Spirit of Christ. Does Christ want it propagated? Yes. Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify these things, the 22 chapters, to the churches. We can understand it, as we'll see in a moment. But should it be taken literally? Why, God promises eternal life or eternal judgment on the basis of either accepting or rejecting the book. So it must be important. It must be uh, understandable. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, he says, I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, if we can either have eternal life or eternal damnation because of either accepting or rejecting it. How can one accept or reject it if he can't understand it because it's mere symbolical language? Put it out of your mind. It's literal. So in chapter 1, God says, blessed is a man who reads, and uh, if he wants to have a real blessing, then he has to understand it, right? So it is understandable. Let me quote that verse, Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. We have an omniscient God. 
That means he knows everything about everything and all things about all things. Acts 15 verse 18 says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the creation. Now wouldn't he be an unwise God to promise a special blessing to those who read this book, to those who hear it expounded, and to those who keep what they read and hear if they could not understand it? No, we can know what it's all about. Furthermore, there's a little outline in chapter 1, verse 19. It says, Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. This will really help one in understanding what this book's all about. Write the things which thou hast seen, the past. That's chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 6. The things which are the present, chapter 3, verses 7 to 22, and the things which shall be future, chapters 4 to 22. So I'm going to lift out a verse, out of the first chapter. To me, the most important thing in chapter 1 is that God promises me a blessing if I read the book of Revelation. Okay, chapters 2 and 3, nothing about judgment yet. Chapter 2 and 3 talk about seven letters. And they're addressed to seven different churches. What are those letters all about, Jack? Why seven churches? The seven churches cover history from the inception of Christianity on the day of Pentecost. And that letter is directed to the church of Ephesus in 33 A.D. and extends to 99 A.D. Then the second letter is to the church of Smyrna beginning at 100 A.D. So each church is a different time frame in church history. And by the time we get to the churches of Philadelphia and Laodicea, we have two churches that coexist at the time of Christ's return. And of course, Philadelphia era began in 1750, but is still with us today. And Laodicea is the Latter-day Church just before Christ returns. Now, in every instance, God has commendations and condemnations of the churches. And we'll see more about this when we look at the two churches in a moment. So five churches are in the past and two churches are present right today, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Okay, tell me the difference in those two churches, Jack. The Church of Philadelphia, which means of course brotherly love, is ready for the coming of the Lord. And in Revelation 3 verse 10 he says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. The word there is ek in the Greek, E-K, meaning out of. This is one of the reasons I believe Christians are not going to go through the tribulation period. He says, I'm going to keep you out of that hour. Uh, the term appears 150 times in the Bible. It always means out of. Out of Egypt have I called my son, Matthew 2, verse 15. And he said, I will spew thee out of my mouth to the Laodiceans, Revelation 3, verse 16. If he wanted us to know that the church would go through the horrendous seven years of tribulation, God omniscient, he knows all things, he would have had the writers of the Greek New Testament put D-I-A, dia. Through. He didn't. He says, I will keep you out of, and I believe in a pre tribulation rapture. I'm such a pre tribulationist, I don't eat post toasties. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go into that other church, the Laodicea church, Jack, and that's the one that we're living in right now, right? Uh, these are the Christians in name only, and God knows the world is filled with them right now. Titus 1 16 says, They profess that they know God. But in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. This is the crowd that cries out, Where is the promise of his coming? Second Peter 3, verse 4. Nothing has changed. They don't want the Lord to come because it's a purifying hope, 1 John 3, 3, and they're not ready. And so the Lord pictures them through the following verbiage in Revelation 3, verses 15 to 17. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked spiritually. Are you noticing now that we are already at chapter 4 and it starts with three very interesting words, wonderful words. It says, come up hither. 
God was speaking to John, according to some people. According to others, he's speaking through John to a group of people. Come up hither. What does he mean by that, Jack? Uh, and which is he doing, speaking to John or through John? It's to all people who know and love the Lord uh, from time past right up to the moment Jesus Christ calls us home in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, to meet Him in the clouds of glory. How do I know that? Because in that chapter, those who were called up are doing something unusual in verses 10 and 11. It says, The four and twenty elders fall down before Him, Jesus, that sits on the throne, and they worship Him that liveth forever and ever, saying, Thou art worthy, Jesus, to receive glory, honor, and power, for Thou hast created all things. Twenty-four elders, they are the representatives of all God's people. There were twelve patriarchs in the Old Testament and twelve apostles in the New Testament. Twelve and twelve, total twenty-four. So all the redeemed of all the ages are there casting their crowns at Christ's feet. Now here's another great argument for a pre-trib rapture. When are the saints crowned? Luke 14, verse 14, you shall be recompensed, crowned at the resurrection of the just. So when we hear that voice come up hither in the dead in Christ rise first, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, immediately they receive their crowns because the resurrection has occurred and they lay them at His feet. And that happens before the tribulation period begins in chapters 6, extending through chapter 18. Well, that was going to be my next question, Jack. You're saying that that this rapture, this come up hither, is before all the judgments start. You know, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But that's before all this happens, right? Right. And again, if you want to really look at these truths in detail, get my book, The Great Escape. Uh, we'll get into the nitty and gritty in that study. But right now, let me give you some thrilling truths as to why we won't be here for the horrendous period of time called the tribulation, or even the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of it, Revelation 7, verse 14. First of all, in Daniel 9, verse 24, God through the prophet says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews. The term weeks there in Hebrew is Shabuah, and a Shabuah is a period of seven years. He says there'll be seventy Shabuahs upon the people of Israel. Well, 69 of those Shabuahs totaled 483 years or 69 weeks. And they all had to do with Israel. Now, why would God change His modus operandi by reverting it now to the Christian church rather than the ones who went through the first 69 weeks, the Israelites? No, it's for them. How do I know that? Because it's the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And Jacob changed his name to Israel in 2 Kings 17, 34. The second argument is the book of Revelation is written chronologically. And so the rapture occurs in chapter 4, verse 1, and the tribulation hour begins in chapter 6, but we have been evacuated. Number three. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7 and 8, it says, The mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now hinders the Antichrist coming to power will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And after he is taken out of the way, then shall that wicked one appear, the Antichrist. Now, who is taken out of the way? The Holy Spirit? No. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. He's God. He cannot be removed from the earth. Study Psalm 139, beginning with verse 7. He's in heaven. He's on earth. He's in hell. He's everywhere. He'll always be everywhere because He's God, the Holy Spirit. But believers have the Holy Spirit living within them. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, and 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. So we are the ones taken and when we are taken, then that wicked one is revealed. But God gave me an argument not long ago, Rexella, that I'd never read anywhere else. The Lord returns to earth in Matthew 25, verse 31. The Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. 
Now, the post-tribulationists, those who say we're going through the seven-year period, proclaim that we're going to meet Christ at that time and we'll bob up and come right back down. Now, that is impossible. Why? If that's the rapture at the end of the seven years, mm -hmm. we get new glorified bodies at that moment. These bodies are changed, Philippians 3, verse 21, 1 John 3, verse 2. And they are deposited in the holy city as he returns in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. So if all believers are taken at the end of the seven years and they meet him in the air, their bodies are changed, they're deposited in the holy city, and now there is no one on earth to go into the millennial reign for the thousand years as far as believers are concerned. For he says, when he hits the earth in verse 34, come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. How can they do it? They're not here. They're in the holy city. All that's left on earth are the unsaved who survived the tribulation hour. And he says to them in verse 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. So now we have zero population on earth. There's no one left. You say, well, how and who will go into it then? Who, if the believers are taken seven years sooner and don't go through the seven-year period tribulation, who will experience it? We'll show you that when we get to chapter 7. You know what, Jack? Uh, a couple of weeks ago on one of our television programs, he said something that really impressed me, and, and it sort of fits in here, I think. God always takes care of his children, his believers. He, he was quoting about Noah, where God said, come in to the ark, and about Lot, where God said to his children, come out. And then you said, I like this, referring to what you're talking about today, come up for believers now, so they escape that judgment that... Uh, oh, it's definite, coming. Rick, so wonderful. Chapter <clears throat> 5, we're already there, and let me just impress something on your hearts here. God starts Chapter 5 talking about music. Music. What is the song that uh, is expressed in Chapter 5? Why are they singing? What are they doing? What's causing them to have this wonderful music, Jack? Another great pre-tribulational argument. They've been taken in chapter 4, verse 1, and now in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, they're singing, listen to the song. They sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy, Jesus, to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Get it? And we shall reign on the earth. We're going to go back with Christ to earth and reign with him. And that's when he comes in Revelation 19, verse 16, as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And his armies follow him in verse 14. For what purpose? Chapter 20, verse 4. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, they were singing about it seven years before that. Now it actually happens. But as we're going to show you even further in this study, after the thousand years, Christ is recommissioned. And his reign on earth goes on forever and ever, Revelation 11, 15. But the saints also rule and reign with him forever and ever in Revelation 22, verse 5. So first they ruled with him for a thousand years, then they reigned with him forever and ever on earth. And you know what I like about it? Every tongue, every people, every nation is there. It means it's the greatest interracial and interdenominational event in world history. And I love that because I believe in drawing God's people together. Mm -hmm. So in heaven, there are not going to be uh, just uh, one race, not going to be just one denomination. We'll all be children of the Lord That's there right. in heaven. Oh, I love that, Jack. We're already at chapter 6, and we're going to be talking about the judgments now. You know where they're found? Only in a few chapters of the book of Revelation are the judgments found. Chapters 6 through 18. That's all. But before we get into that, I just want to ask Jack a question. God never gives judgment unless he has a very, very good reason. Why would God allow judgment to come on people that he loves? on earth that he created and loves. Why is he allowing all this judgment, Jack? Well, as we approach the tribulation period, Jesus said, iniquity shall abound, Matthew 24, verse 12. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But during that seven-year period, it's a time of unparalleled commandment breaking. They will never have broken God's holy commandments in such a manner ever in history as they will during that point of time. So Jack is telling us that 
uh, commandment breaking is going to happen during this particular time of history in an unprecedented way. Uh, let me just name the Ten Commandments very, very quickly. We'll go back and forth here and let Jack tell us exactly how they're being broken in this book of Revelation. All right, Jack? All right. The first one, <clears throat> thou shalt have no gods before me. In Revelation 13, verse 1, the Antichrist comes to power and he magnifies himself above every God, Daniel 11, 36, and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, proclaiming himself as God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. The leader of the world church comes to power in Revelation 13, verse 11, for we have a political leader in Revelation 13, verse 1, the Antichrist, and we have the religious leader in Revelation 13, verse 11. And he gets the crowds of that day to make an image to this Antichrist, verse 14. And by the way, they all worship this image in Revelation 13, verse 8. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And you know what that word vain means? It means having no real value. I don't know when I have ever heard the name of the Lord taken in vain as much as today, Jack. So is the name of God going to be taken in vain in an unprecedented way? And does the book of Revelation reveal that? In Revelation chapter 16 verses 8 and 9, we find that the fourth angel pours out his bowl of judgment upon the sun, and power was given unto the sun, S-U-N, to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with a great heat, and blasphemed the name of God because of these plagues, and they repented not. And then in verse 18, there is a horrendous earthquake. In verse 21, there is a hailstorm where blocks of ice fall from the heavenlies. And again, they blaspheme the name of God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath day is eternally connected with Israel, with the Jewish people, Exodus 31, 13. It's an eternal memorial with them from Yahweh God. So they have to have worship again on the Sabbath day during that seven year period of tribulation because it's the time of Jacob's trouble as we already indicated in Jeremiah 30 verse 7 and Jacob is Israel or the Jewish race. The Antichrist allows the Jewish people to have their new temple and they've got sacrifices going on in that temple and in the midst of the Shabua, in the midst of the seven year period, the Antichrist breaks all agreements with them and stops their sacrifices, Daniel 9 verse 27. And because of it, uh, their religious liberties are finished, Sabbath day and all. Honor your father and your mother. In Revelation 9 21, we find that they would not repent of their murders, their sorceries, drug abuses, their fornication, sexual promiscuities, and their thefts. And the hearts of parents are broken because of it. And of course, with all the killings that have been going on even in our schools today, and uh, killing around the world of ethnic group against ethnic group and so forth, this one certainly is broken. Thou shalt not kill. We'll be using this text a number of times, Revelation 9, 21, they repented not of their murders. It's going to be an age of murder. In fact, one third of the population of the earth will be destroyed in Revelation 9, 18. And as far as believers are concerned, in Revelation 13, verse 15, and Revelation 20, verse 4, they are put to death for their testimony and beheaded because of the witness they have for Jesus. Thou shalt not steal. That again is Revelation 9, 21. They repented not of their thefts. It's going to be a time of unprecedented uh, thievery. Number eight, Jack. Thou shalt not commit adultery. In Revelation 9, verse 21, we again find that they repented not of their fornications. Now that is the term to cover all immoral practices. In 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 and 2, it defines fornication. It said, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. So fornication is a sex outside of marriage. And it's going to inundate the land. It's already here. And Jack, this one is so easy to break. I think a lot of people break this every day. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. The Antichrist is going to come to power through lying wonders, 2 Thessalonians 
2, verse 9. And you know, we talked about that holy city of Revelation 21 and 22. Well, chapter 21, verse 8, and chapter 22, verse 15, both state that outside of the holy city are liars, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. You know, it's so easy even for people in the churches today to lie. Oh, they call it a little white fib. But in Proverbs 6, 16 to 18, it says, These six things doth God hate. Number one, a lying tongue. And this one will get us into trouble. If we want what somebody else has, thou shalt not covet. In Revelation 18, we find in verses 11 to 13, 28 gorgeous baubles of life the pearls, the gold, and all the other delicacies that men enjoy. And verse 14 says, their soul lusted after it, because it's going to be a time when most of the world has riches galore while the third world and other parts suffer. But it's all going to end. The stock market's coming down. Revelation 18, verse 10 says, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Verse 17, in one hour so great riches has come to naught, to nothing. Verse 19, for in one hour is she, Babylon, made desolate. Mm. All right, now we're in chapter 6, and you have seen the blessing, you've seen the letters, you've seen the come up hither. Now we're going to talk about, uh, and also why God allows the judgment on earth. We're going to talk now about the judgments, starting with chapter 6. There are 21 of them. Uh, we're going to divide them seven, 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 because God does that. <laughs> the first seven are called sealed, and you know, those are like scrolls, and you break the seal open. All right, that's the first seven. The second seven are seven trumpets, where someone's playing a trumpet, and every time the trumpet is sounded, that's a judgment. And then the seven vile judgments, it's like a bowl, and every time that vial is poured out, there's another judgment. So you have seven, 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 total of 21. Now, six of the 21, are found in the sixth chapter of Revelation. Now, you've heard about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We dealt with this very thoroughly on one of our Jack and Impey programs. Uh, they are the first four judgments, or the first seal judgments. Uh, let me just name them very, very quickly, and, and Jack can tell us exactly what they mean. The first one is uh, a rider on a white horse. And that's Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And since Satan is a counterfeiter and he fills the heart of Antichrist, Antichrist wants to duplicate the coming of our Lord Jesus on a white horse in Revelation 19, verse 11. But I want to say something very dogmatically now. These people who poo-poo the book of Revelation, symbolical, you don't understand it. Wait a minute. I'm going to show you at this point that all six of these beginning judgments were mentioned by Christ in Matthew 24. They're identical. Jesus said that there would be false Christs and false prophets in Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, and 24. This Antichrist is one of those false Christs, and the world religious leader is that false prophet. So the Lord had the first judgment of Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2, exactly right. And let me say that he rises in chapter 13, verse 1, and has control over all the world, as we'll see later, verse 7. So we're right on track. He's riding, and he's going to appear soon. So Jesus talks about the judgments. Yes. All right. Then the rider, uh, the second horseman of the apocalypse, is the one that rides on a red horse. That's Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, and he takes peace from the earth. What did you say, Jesus, in Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7? He said, ethnic group will rise against ethnic group, kingdom against kingdom, and there should be wars. And again, Christ had it right. Don't say you can't accept the book of Revelation when Christ gave the same signs in Matthew 24. If you get rid of the book of Revelation, get rid of the book of Matthew and get rid of what Christ taught. And we believe that this rider on the red horse is Russia. There's going to be a peace pact in Israel, Daniel 9, 27, for seven years. And in the midst of it, Russia moves to the Middle East and says, I will go against them 
Israelites that are at rest. Ezekiel 38, 11, Israel's never been at rest for 2,500 years, so this is our era of time. Okay, so that rider on the red horse is somebody who's riding for war. Right. Right? All right, the third horseman uh, is riding a black horse. And of course, Jesus mentioned that in Matthew 24, verse 7, when he said, There shall be famines. This black horse denotes a time of famine during the seven year period of tribulation that is unprecedented. And that's why the angel is heard saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, a measure of wheat for a penny. A measure was 16 ounces in Christ's day and a penny was a day's wages, so they'll be able to buy a loaf of bread for one full day of labor. Mm, my, oh, my. So uh, then the fourth horseman of the apocalypse rides a pale horse. What does that mean, Jim? In the Greek, that's chloros, a sickly-looking horse. And Jesus mentioned that as well when he said in Matthew 24, verse 7, there shall be pestilences, identical signs, ladies and gentlemen. But let's look at this one for a moment in Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. This is the only writer that's named and says, His name was death and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them, death and hell, to destroy mankind by sword, hunger, death, and the beasts of the earth. And now we have the green monkey virus, and the AIDS epidemic is sweeping the globe. It's going to take the lives of millions, and it's caused by the green monkey virus. And I'm very sorry to have to give you this fifth judgment because it talks about people who are being killed. They're being martyred, actually. Why are they being martyred, Jack? Revelation 6, verse 9 states, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of their testimony, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus mentioned that one as well in Matthew 24, verse 9. He says, You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. When this Antichrist comes to power and the false prophet of Revelation 13, 11 has this image made in his likeness, he forces the people to bow and worship the image of Antichrist, and those who refuse to do it are put to death in Revelation 13, verse 15. And then in Revelation 20, verse 4, he says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God because they would not receive the mark of the beast. 666 of Revelation 13, verses 17 and 18. So during the time of the tribulation, there are going to be people who refuse the mark and they're going to be killed for that reason, oh, definitely, right? Definitely, definitely. Mm. Now you remember that I said that six judgments are found in chapter 6. Well, this is the sixth, the last of those judgments found in that chapter. It's verse 12, speaking about a horrendous earthquake that actually will blacken the sun and the moon. Now we've had all kinds of earthquakes on earth before, but nothing like this. How could the sun be blackened and the moon blackened, Jack? Let me quote Revelation 6, 12. I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Carl Sagan, now deceased, said, one day an asteroid or a meteorite will hit the earth. It'll be so gigantic that it will cause darkness over the face of the earth for 120 days, four solid months, as the dust rises to the heavens and blocks out the rays of the sun. Now, isn't it strange? Jesus also mentioned that sixth judgment in Matthew 24, 29, when he said, immediately after the tribulation of those days toward the end of the seven-year period, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. I want to say it one more time. Don't you ever mock the book of Revelation again unless you're ready to mock what Jesus said because they are the identical six signs. Some people say that this earth's going to be destroyed by an asteroid. <laughs> Will it? Absolutely not. We're going to see why it won't be later. I really love chapter 7. Isn't God good? Because right in the middle of telling us about all these judgments, all of a sudden we've got a parenthesis. And it's a parenthesis of love from God, whereby He's saying, not everything's going to be bad because right in the middle of all this, I'm going to show my love because there's going to be a great spiritual revival on earth. And Jack, I, I just love that thought. Remember when we were discussing the rapture and 
God's people being taken before the seven years? Well, if they're taken, who is on earth then to go into the millennium? The believers have at this point been evacuated and is there a possibility that there'll be millions of conversions during that seven year period? Yes, because the greatest revival ever to occur takes place. I've heard the skeptics say, how is that possible if the Holy Spirit has been taken? I already proved you the Holy Spirit will never be taken, Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. He'll always be here. In fact, He's going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh during the tribulation period, Joel 2, verse 28, Acts 2, verse 17. It's going to be a tremendous time. And what happens? Chapter 7, we find in verses 4 to 8 that there are 144,000 flaming evangelists filled with the Holy Spirit of God who propagate the gospel of the kingdom of Matthew 24, 14 to the uttermost parts of the earth. We preach the gospel of grace. They will be preaching the good news of the kingdom. The king is coming. The king is coming. I've heard groups like uh, the British Israelites say that these are Englishmen. And we hear all kinds of theories about the 144,000. But uh, as one studies the name of these 144,000, there are 12,000 from 12 different tribes uh, for the total of 144,000. And the names of the tribes are Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Nephtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. And now that doesn't sound like Sir Heathcliff or Winston Churchill, does it? <laughs> <laughs> These are Jews. And they're preaching the king is coming because he's going to come to their land in Zechariah 14, verse 16, to set up his kingdom as well as in Luke 1, verses 32 and 33. Now... John sees something in verse 9. He says, I saw a multitude which no man could number, millions upon millions. Who are they? What's happened? Verse 14. These are they which have come out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And these are the millions who will meet Jesus when he returns to earth to go with him into that kingdom. When he says, Come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, verse 34. I want to linger on seven, just for a second. We had great revivals here on earth before. Billy Graham, T.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, Jack Van Impey, but we've never seen anything like what's going to happen uh, described in chapter seven. Right? Well, it's often been said that persecution brings people face to face with God, mm -hmm. and I believe that's what's going to happen. All right, let's go into <clears throat> chapter 8 and chapter 9. Now, uh, judgments 7 through 13 are found in chapter 8 and chapter 9. And uh, the last of the sealed judgments, uh, that's number 7, is of found... Of the original group, Of yes. the original group, chapter 8, verse 1. Jack, what's that one? It says, There was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. Bob Ripley, and believe it or not, years ago, asked a question one day in his column, Will There Be Women in Heaven? The next day he had the answer, Revelation 8, 1, No, there was silence in heaven for the space of <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> oh, I had to get that in, Rexella. Let's get serious, though. There's solemnity in heaven, quietness, silence, because they're contemplating the next seven judgments. Now that's the last of the seal judgments, number seven. Now we're going to go into the trumpet judgment, starting with the second section of seven, and that's found in uh, chapter eight, verse seven. Give us that one, Jack. Hail and fire fall upon the earth, and a third of the earth is burned. Mm, all right, and then eight, eight. That's the second of the trumpet judgments. A meteorite falls into the ocean, and a third part of the sea becomes bloody and deadly. Oh, Jack, we've just polluted our seas so much. I was just talking to our men about that uh, here in our studio, what we've done to our oceans and our seas. Oh, well, number three, chapter eight, verse 10. A star falls into the waters and they become bitter. And this is so interesting because in the Ukrainian Bible, they actually have the word Chernobyl. Yes. In our English version, it's wormwood. 
but Wormwood, translated into the Ukrainian language, is Chernobyl, and it's Chernobyl that poisons the waters, and we're going to have more of that in the future. Oh, yes, dumping all that nuclear waste yeah. uh, that we've done around yeah. the world. Right. We're polluting our waters. And then here's the fourth one of the Trumpet Judgments, chapter 8, verse 12. A judgment falls in a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars are diminished in their brightness. Darkness permeates the land, and the angels fly through the heavenlies crying, whoa, 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 by reason of the next three trumpet judgments that are about to be unleashed upon the earth. And that's what Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24, 29, when he said, immediately after the tribulation of those days toward the end of the seven-year period, shall the sun be darkened. I mentioned this earlier. This is sort of a repeat, only in an extended way of a judgment that happened earlier. Then the fifth trumpet, it sounds, and a terrible judgment happens in chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. Locusts come out of the bottomless pit, and demonic spirits flood the land, and it's a time of evil like this world has never known. But in the midst of all of that, as I've already said, millions have been converted because the power of the Holy Spirit is permeating the land as well. And it's going to get so bad through these locusts and through these demonic spirits that verse 6 says, in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. They'll want to die. Whoa. They can't. Oh, terrible. Can you see where we're going, friends? Actually, our world today is leading up to everything we're talking about. Pollution of the sea, uh, the sun abounds in an unparalleled way. The commandment, uh, commandments are being broken around the world in an unprecedented way. Well, now this is the sixth trumpet that's going to be sounded in, oh my, judgment. Chapter 9, verse 13. Jack, take just a little extra time here, will you, and explain All it? Right. I'll explain this fully when I get to chapter 16 in the Battle of Armageddon, but at this point, this is the second phase of the Armageddon battle, the second invasion as the Oriental hordes come to the Middle East. And Revelation 9, verses 14 to 18 states, and I quote, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates to slay a third part of mankind. Verse 16, the number of the army was 200,000, 200 million. Verse 18, by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone. I've said this often on television. I want to repeat it. This could not have been in John's day when this was fulfilled because I read recently where a minister in Illinois said, oh, all these things happened in the first century. Hey, there weren't 200 million people on the face of the earth in the first century. So, sir, you've got something mixed up in your theology. But now, China alone has 1 billion, 200 million, plus Japan and Korea and all these Oriental nations. They can produce this kind of army. And when it happens, the blitzkrieg that will inundate the world through war will be unfathomable. God help us. Well, now in chapter 10, through uh, chapter 11, verse 12, we have something that I love. Again, remember chapter 7? We had that wonderful parenthesis of God's love. Well, we got it again here. God seems to kind of go in sixes. After six terrible judgments, then he has a wonderful parenthesis of love. And we've seen six trumpet judgments here, and now we have another parenthesis of love. What happens? He sends two witnesses from heaven. And they go around the earth and they're preaching and they're telling that the Lord is going to come and stop everything, these horrible things that are going on on the earth. And Jack, tell us, if you will, please, what's it like on earth when these preachers are preaching that the Lord is coming? Are people receptive? First, let me tell you who they are. Some say that they are Enoch and Elijah, also called Elias. We know that one of them will definitely be Elijah or Elias because of Malachi 4, verse 5, which plainly states it. However, I believe that the other one will be Moses. And I base that upon Matthew, the 17th chapter, beginning with verse 1. After six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them 
apart into a high mountain and was transfigured before them. This is a picture of Christ's return to the earth. He's giving them a preview. And there appeared Elias and Moses. Because they appeared at that point in time and because it's a picture of that great day when he returns, I feel that they are the two witnesses. Now they proclaim the message that the king is coming for a period of three and one half years. Finally, the Antichrist becomes so perturbed with their proclamations that he has them put to death. And they're lying in the streets for three and a half days, just like Khomeini did to our American soldiers, and all television could see their bodies there. But there's a miracle. Suddenly, they're raised from the dead by the power of God, and they hear a voice saying, Come up hither, and they sweep through glory, and are once again in the presence of the Lord to return with Him within a very, very short time, for this is approximately at the end of the tribulation period, just before Christ comes in this very chapter. And it's exciting when one thinks of all of these things, mm -hmm. Rexella, and how it's all going to happen. I like the parenthesis, don't you? <laughs> God is such a God of love. He gives everybody an opportunity to the nth degree. If, if there's just a hunger in anybody's heart, He's going to give them that opportunity to open their heart to the Lord Jesus. Well, we need to go on in chapter 11, and here is the seventh trumpet in the seventh judgment. And I'm going to ask uh, that you read along with me the words that you see on the screen. It's from Revelation 11:15 through 18. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Now this is the hard part. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And that is the seventh judgment, the seventh trumpet being sounded, Jack. And as the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 15, where it says, He shall reign forever and ever. This is where Handel got his idea for the Hallelujah Chorus. He shall reign forever and forever and forever. The world is never going to end. I'm so glad God gave me this light about 24 months ago. Let me say this right now. When all this is happening, or accelerated, the nations become angry. You see, He has come to put a stop to those who are destroying the earth and destroying one another in that 18th verse, and they're angry. That's the exact picture of Revelation chapter 19. He comes regally, royally, majestically on that white horse in verse 11. The armies in heaven follow him, verse 14. When he comes as the King of kings and Lord of lords, verse 16. But in verses 17 to 19, the nations are angry and they say, we don't want Christ to rule over us. We don't want him for our king. And verse 19 says, I saw the beast. That's one of the titles of the Antichrist. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on that white horse. That is literally the European Union which will uncover and explain a little more thoroughly later as we progress in this series. Now, may I shock you? This completes the entire story. We could end it with Revelation 11, verse 15. He shall reign forever and ever. Chapters 12 to 19 only repeat this time period and add a few other details, but otherwise, that would be it. The coming of the Lord as he puts a stop to all the destruction in the world. And then they beat their swords and the plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks and shall learn war no more, Isaiah 2, verse 4. So actually, there are two appearings of the Lord, one to take us up and the other one will return with the Lord. And, and that appearing when he comes to earth will happen in the Holy Land in Jerusalem, correct? You better believe it. 
Now, those two appearings, the first one is called the rapture, when we're caught up in the twinkling of an eye to meet Christ in the clouds of glory, the dead and the living, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And in the Latin Vulgate, Jerome was the first one to use the terminology when he came to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, the words caught up. He had a happy more, caught up, raptured. Seven years later, we return with the Lord, and that is called the Revelation, just like the book, Revelation. But it means He reveals Himself to the whole world as He sets up His kingdom on the face of the earth. Here we are at chapter 12, and we have to figure out where Satan is. Well, what's he doing during all of this time? Well, you know, Satan dwells in heaven one and two, not three, because that's where God dwells. But Satan sends his emissaries down to earth and uh, demons, if you will, and tells them to do their terrible deeds. So don't blame God for what's going on on earth when something bad happens. That comes from Satan. He's the God of this world. But uh, something happens to Satan in chapter 12. He's cast out of heaven 1 and 2, down to the earth. And I have a good question for Jack. Why does God do that? Why does He cast him out? P-R-I-D-E, pride. He was the anointed cherub angel that covered, serving our Lord, Ezekiel 28, 14. But he was dissatisfied. He didn't want to be second in command. He wanted to rise above God, as recorded in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend in the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, God's throne in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the heavens. I, I, I will be like the most high God. And he fell. Jesus said in Luke 10, verse 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, he was only cast out of the third heaven. Someone said, what's Van Impey trying to teach that there are three heavens? Well, I just believe the Bible, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2 says that Paul was caught up to the third heaven. The first heaven consists of the atmosphere, trophosphere, stratosphere, mephosphere, ionosphere, and exosphere. And that's from 10 miles upward to 600 miles. The astronomers are now telling us that from 600 miles upward, we have the second heaven, which is toward the end of the cosmos when we hit 14 trillion billion miles. Unfathomable. And God's throne, the third heaven, is above that. Satan was cast out of the third heaven where God rules, but he's been in charge of heavens one and two since his fall. That's why he is called the prince of the power of the air, of the heavens, Ephesians 2.2. 2. That's why Paul, through the Holy Spirit, said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, other human beings, but against spirit, demonic spirits in high places. Now, he's been in control of these two heavens, but even that is going to end shortly, and that's what this chapter is all about, concerning the great red dragon, as he's called in verse 3. The war in the heavenlies is recorded in the 7th through the 13th verses of this chapter. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan. The dragon and his angels, fallen angels, fought against Michael, and they prevailed not. They were cast out. They're cast to the earth at this point in time. No more are they going to hinder the angels that come through the heavenlies. And you know, God showed me something one day. I believe that since Christ is going to return and come as a bowl of lightning through those heavens, they have to be cleared before He comes. So in this chapter, they're cast to earth. And so the 12th verse says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath. Why? because he knows that he has but a short time. He only has 42 months left. 
And this one who has always wanted to be God, who lost his position in the heavenlies because he said, I'm going to rise above God, is actually going to incarnate the body of Antichrist in the next chapter, as we'll see. And it's only at that point that he begins magnifying himself above God, Daniel 11, 36, and exalting himself above all that is called God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. So he's coming down soon because I believe we're in the last days. Mm, my, oh, my. Well, chapter 13 is really a chapter of explanation. God wants us to understand just a little bit better about that very first judgment that's found in chapter 6. And you remember the horseman who rode the white horse? Well, God talks about who that is exactly. And it is the Antichrist, a man. And then he also talks about his buddy, a friend, who is the false prophet. Uh, let's deal, first of all, with the Antichrist, that man who rides that white horse. Jack, uh, what is this Antichrist and what will he be like? In Revelation 13, this chapter, verse 1, the Holy Spirit through John says, I saw the beast, this Antichrist, this world dictator, the head of the new world order, rise up out of the sea the sea of nations having seven heads and ten horns. Now the sea there is the Mediterranean and all the European Union nations are surrounding that sea presently. But this is the European Union. Now watch carefully. This one who rises to power as this global dictator is first of all for the three and a half years controlled by Satan. But now Satan has been cast out as we saw a few moments ago from heaven to earth, and he incarnates the body of Antichrist. That's only because he's now inside that body that this one is saying, I'm God. You see, Satan has always wanted to be God. Now he's finally made it inside of a man. Okay, why does the world accept it? Because in Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, we have a war described which the Jews call the Battle of the Ages and Christians call Armageddon of Revelation 16, 16. And it's during this war that the Antichrist is killed. Right. That's when Russia and China and the rest of the nations march to the Middle East. He's killed, yes. He comes to his end, Daniel eleven forty five. But now in Revelation 13, 3, his deadly wound is healed. He is resurrected just like Christ was and the world begins to marvel after him. Wonder, why he must be that God. Only Christ rose from the dead throughout history. Now he has risen. And because of this, they accept him. And he now gains control over all people, kindreds, tongues, and nations. Verse 7. And... Uh, the world says he is God. But there's another character who's going to help him get to that place. Okay, there we have the Antichrist who is the rider on the white horse, the first horseman of the apocalypse. And uh, he comes out of the European Union. The, the Antichrist comes out of Europe somewhere because that is the revived Roman Empire. Well, then he has a buddy. And he is the head of the world church. Now here you have the Antichrist who's head of the world government. And here we have someone who's the head of the world church. And that is his friend. Explain just a little bit, Jack, about this uh, false prophet. And I've got to take time because this is where everyone gets confused. There are two leaders. One political, Revelation 13, one. One who's religious, Revelation 13, 11. The religious one tries to get people to worship this politician. He puts everything he has behind it. Now, Revelation 13, 11, speaking about this second beast, tells us, I saw another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. Now, he's connected with Christianity because he has the two horns of a lamb, and that's the title of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who Take it away, the sin of the world, John 1, 29. But he speaks as a dragon, and that's satanic, Revelation 20, verse 2. So he's an apostate. He compromises. Once he gets to power with his world religion, and we'll explain that when we get to chapter 17, he does wonders, miracles before the people, verse 13. 
and deceives them. Verse 14, he gets the people to make an image in the likeness of this Antichrist. And this image not only speaks, but through all of it, a mark is given to the people of the day. Probably a robot that speaks, connected with computers, to do the following. Watch it, Revelation 13, verses 15 to 18. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all world government, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six hundred we know. A score is twenty. Three score is sixty. And then there's a six. So there's the infamous number that the rock and roll groups and others have at times mocked six, six, six. But it's there, it's coming, and there is chapter 13 portrayed as it will soon happen. All right, chapter 14 deals with seven visions. Now, we're not going to name the visions, but you might want to refer to them right now, Jack, if you will, please. I just want to say that we're not going to get involved in the seven visions because we'll be actually dealing with what they predict as we progress. Uh, chapter 15. Now, some of you are counting and you're saying, Rex, all there are 21 judgments in the book of Revelation. You've only dealt with 14. Where are the other seven? Well, in chapter 15, those tiny little eight verses are sort of an introduction to the last seven, but they are found in chapter 16. And I'm just going to name those uh, and I'll let, then let Jack, if he will, please elaborate on them. Chapter 16, verse 2 gives us the first of the last seven judgments, and they are called the seven bowl, B-O-W-L, or vial judgments, and they are poured out of that bowl on the earth. The first outpouring of bowl one is after people receive the mark of the beast. What happens to those people? That's the first judgment of the last seven. The text states that a sore breaks out upon their bodies of all those who have received the mark 666 and all those who worship the image of this beast as mentioned in Revelation 13 verse 8. In uh, Revelation 16 3, uh, the next judgment is the extension of uh, the trumpet judgment, number two. Isn't that correct, Jack? Right. In Revelation 8, verses 8 and 9, we saw where a third of the sea became bloody, and now there's a magnification as the bowl is poured out upon the sea because every living creature in the sea dies. Can you imagine everything in the oceans, in the seas are going to die? Horrible judgment on the earth. And then again, that's because people are turning from God more and more and more. The next judgment is an extension of trumpet three, Revelation 16, four. Jack, can you explain that one, please? Yeah. First of all, in Revelation 8, verse 10, we describe Chernobyl. That is what's actually in the Ukrainian Bible and it poisons the rivers and it's happened. And now we again have an extension of that in this third bowl judgment as it's tipped because all of the rivers and fountains of waters become deadly. And the next judgment, God elaborates on uh, one of the sealed judgments. And this is found in Revelation 16, 8 and 9. And it's the judgment on the sun. You know, we are living in perilous times where I believe the, the Bible talks about the sun scorching people on earth, Jack. Right. The fourth angel poured out his bowl of judgment upon the sun, S-U-N, and power was given unto the sun to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with a great heat. Then the next judgment, ah, uh, well, this one I can almost say amen to. It's found in Revelation 16, 10, and it's the judgment upon that man riding that white horse or the judgment on the Antichrist. And as this angel tips the bowl of judgment upon the earth, it throws a complete darkness over all the world and the empire of 
the Antichrist. And of course, Jesus, I've already mentioned this, talked about it, and that is occurring toward the end of the seven-year period of tribulation when he said in Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon will turn as blood. You'll also find that in Joel chapter 2, verse 31, and Acts chapter 2, verse 20, and Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. Can you see where these last seven judgments are just an extension of some of them that already happened. God is just really explaining them of how intense they're going to get. The sixth one has to do with the war, and it repeats uh, the sixth trumpet judgment having to do with Armageddon. And God tells us what it's going to be like. I think there's so much misunderstanding on the subject of Armageddon. First of all, there are going to be a series of battles. And when they meet at Megiddo, it is not to battle there. It's only to gather the troops. Revelation 16, verse 16, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, or Ha Megiddo. We find that gathering again in Joel chapter 3, verse 2. And after they're gathered, they march to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Why? Because that's just in front of Jerusalem. What's the purpose of that? Because here the term is again in Zechariah 14, verse 2, he gathers all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now, the Jewish writers talked about the Midrash Tehillim, saying that when this horrendous war occurs, and they say the Christians call it Armageddon, there will be three major invasions. And I wondered, how's that possible? Where's that located? And one day the Spirit of God led me to Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45. First of all, we see the European Union. Now watch the four points of the compass here, north, south, east, and west. The west, the European Union, is there to try to stem and stop the forces who are going to attempt to destroy Israel in Daniel 11, verses 41 to 43. Now, who comes against Israel? Well, after the peace has been made, Daniel 9, verse 27, and that could happen in the very near future, it's Russia that makes the first move, saying in Ezekiel 38, verse 11, I'll go against them that are at rest, that dwell safely. Any of you who know history understand that Israel has not been at rest for 2,500 years. But in 1948, they became a nation. In 1967, they captured Jerusalem. Now they're making peace negotiations for the first time in 25 centuries, and it's going to happen. But when they say peace and safety, then cometh sudden destruction upon them as travail upon a woman with child, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. And that's when Russia says, I'm going to go against them that are at rest, that are at peace. That's only happened in your generation. It did not happen, again, I repeat it, for 2,500 years, 75 to 100 generations. We're living in tremendous times because this ties in with the coming of the Lord. Now, that first move is from the north and south, Daniel 11, verse 40. That's Russia and the king of the south, Egypt, who heads up an entire Arab federation to move against Israel. That's easy to picture in such an hour as we live. They're driven back to Siberia, Joel 2, verse 20. They're defeated. The second move occurs as China makes the invasion of the Middle East. Now, the armies left over from the Russian invasion join them, and that's the army from the north and the east, the king of the north and the kings, plural, of the east, Daniel 11, 44. We described this earlier when we were in chapter 9, verses 14 to 18. But we didn't describe who they were. It says the army is 200,000, 1,000, verse 16, and by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, smoke, and brimstone, verse 18. But watch the direction from which they come. It says in Revelation 16, verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl of judgment upon the great 
river Euphrates so that the waters were dried up so that the way of the kings of the east or the British Revised Version, so that the way of the kings of the sun rising might be prepared. They come across the Euphrates area on dry ground. What causes the waters to dissipate? Isn't it strange that the Anatolia project in Turkey has 21 dams and 17 hydroelectric plants, and when they push a few electronic devices, push the buttons for them, they can shut off all these areas so that for the first time in world history, these Eastern armies can make the move over dry land. Well, that is the second invasion. They're defeated. And finally, all nations come against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, verse 2. And when that happens, God intervenes as he comes to fight on behalf of his chosen people, verse 3. And his feet stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem in the east, and the Mount of Olives cleaves down the middle from east to west. And he zaps the enemy in verse 12 with a great plague and then sets up his glorious kingdom in verse 16. And it says, all those who are left of the nations that came against Jerusalem will come up year by year to Jerusalem. To worship the King, the Lord of hosts. That's Mashiach for the Jew. That's Christ for the Christian. Here we are coming up on the final judgment, the 21st judgment, which is the seventh of the bowl judgments. Pour it out of that bowl, pour it out of that uh, vial. And it has to do with the greatest earthquake that has ever taken place and also hailstones coming out of uh, the heavens, a hailstorm. And it's found in chapter 16, verses 18 through 21, Jack. In verse 18, he says, there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the face of the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. I realized recently that that ties in with Armageddon, verse 16. Let's keep it in context. Verse 16, Armageddon. Verse 18, the earthquake. Now, how is that possible? Do you remember that when Christ comes back to stop what the world is doing and how men are destroying one another in Revelation 11:18? And when he comes to the earth in Zechariah 14, verse 4, and his feet hit the Mount of Olives, the earthquake is so great that the Mount of Olives splits down the center. Well, that's it. That's the greatest earthquake in history mentioned here in verse 18. Then verse 21 adds that there was a great hail that fell out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, approximately 100 pound pieces of ice falling to the earth. They tell us that they're up there the size of houses, and if they can ever get through without dissolution and melting, it's a possibility. And what happens? Do men say, oh, Lord, I need you. I want you to no. know. They blaspheme the name of God and repented not. What a sad commentary on the human race. Jack, when you stop to think about the power of God, we cannot even imagine. The earthquake in Turkey was horrible. We've had horrible ones in California, around the world. Also, those terrible storms in Europe that uprooted all those thousands and thousands and thousands of trees in France. 300 and million. 300 million, Jack. It'll take them 200 years to restore what's happened. Well, when you stop to think about God's power, we haven't seen anything compared to that. Boy. Oh, right. And yet people still won't turn to him, as Jack just mentioned. Chapter 17 and 18, I truly like because it's another parenthesis. And you have heard about the separation of church and state here in the United States. Well, uh, during the time that chapter 17 is written, there's a uniting of church and state. Of course, the state under the auspices of the Antichrist and the uh, false prophet has the church. They do unite, but it is not forever. They're going to have their demise, Jack. We have the union of church and world in Revelation 13. The politician arises in verse 1 and the leader of the world church in verse 11 who has the two horns of a lamb identifying him with Christianity but speaks as a dragon identifying him with satanic powers and he unites all the religions
religions of the world, doesn't matter what their label is. The true believers were evacuated previously through the words come up hither of Revelation 4, verse 1. Now there's been a great revival and there are millions of Christians still left upon the face of the earth and he wants to force them into the world church. And of course, the majority refuse and lose their lives when they will not go into it. Revelation 13, verse 15 and chapter 20, verse 4. The leader of this world church and she's called the mother of harlots and abominations to the earth in verse 5 is designated by that title because she commits spiritual adultery with the politicians of the world and all the other religions that deny that Christ is God. What is spiritual adultery? James 4.4, 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. So because of this union of church and world, she has committed spiritual adultery and bears that label. Now, she sits upon many waters in verse 1, typifying global control as defined in verse 15. She has risen to power on the back of the beast with seven heads and ten horns in verse 7. And that's the European Union. There will only be seven world empires, Revelation 17, 10, as previously mentioned. And that, of course, is Assyria and Egypt, then Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and revived Rome. This is that final world empire. And she got to where she is because of working closely with the global leader of the new world order. But, Rexella, before it's all said and done, when he gets to the place where he wants to be as the leader of the new world order and doesn't need the church anymore, he burns her with fire. He destroys her as the chapter ends. So that's a picture of this 17th chapter. Well, have you heard of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? That's going to happen again. In chapter 18, it does happen. Now, if you watch our program, Jack Van Impey presents every single week. You know Jack has been telling us, as he mentioned just a moment ago, the European Union is the revived Roman Empire. They are going to fall again. Tell us about it. Will you, Jack, please? In this 18th chapter, we see something unusual. She's called Babylon. Dr. Logsdon of the Moody Memorial Church attempted to show the world that Babylon is modern America through Isaiah chapter 18, verse 1, Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, and this chapter, Revelation 18. I have a tendency to agree with much of what he said. Now, we see in this 18th chapter that Babylon is a land of wealth, loaded with sin, but wealthy. And all of the luxurious baubles of life are hers in verses 11 to 13, 28 different items. The stock markets are booming. She has everything she wants. She doesn't need God. Sin is rampant. And then judgment comes. Verses 10, 17, and 19 state, In one hour is thy judgment come. In one hour so great riches has come to naught, to nothing. In one hour she made desolate. Now that can easily happen through a failure in the computer systems. Or it can easily happen through terroristic activities or through a bombardment. They were warning us now about terrorists and what they might do in New York City. In the subways, similar to what happened in Japan just a couple of years ago. Whatever it is, they collapse. And it's the end of this world power. Many believe it's the European Union. With this, I could agree. However, as we progress, we'll see where they come to their demise through the power of God when Jesus Christ, who is God, returns to set up his kingdom. You know, again, we hear some music. Uh, did you know there was that much music in the book of Revelation? But in chapter 19, it starts out with a wonderful hallelujah chorus because it is a kind of a rerun of chapter 11 proclaiming the return of Christ, not in the clouds, but to the earth. And certainly that return of Christ to the earth will be a glorious time, won't it, Jack? Really well, Rexella. 
Now, the reason they're singing is because Christ is finally going to be united with his bride, the church. And they're saying, salvation to our God, hallelujah. It's really the Hebrew, hallelujah. And we get to verses 7 and 8, and that great wedding is described. You see, while we're going through this pilgrim journey here on earth, we are engaged to Christ. And one can find that in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 27 onward. And as we walk through this world, he wants us to be pure virgins. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. That's why once we hear the come up hither of Revelation 4, 1, an examination begins. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Every one of us should give account of himself to God, Romans 14, verse 12. And one can find the examination that will be meted out at that hour in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 to 15. And some are going to be ashamed, ashamed. 1 John 2, 28, some will stand there with confidence. This investigation takes place just before the marriage because Christ wants all of his bride purified before the wedding ceremony. Now it happens. That's why they're singing. In this 19th chapter, I repeat verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, Christ, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, the bride, the church, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in clean and fine linen. And this fine linen is the righteousnesses of the saints. You see, the King James Version has it wrong when it says righteousness singular. It's righteousnesses. When one gets saved, the righteousness of Christ is applied. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, because salvation is a free gift. But we create our own wedding gown for that great day by our righteousnesses, our works. We're not saved by works, but when we're saved, true conversion produces works, Ephesians 2.10. At this point, Christ returns to the earth with his bride for the marriage supper of the Lamb as found in verse 9. Why couldn't they have it in heaven? Why did they have to come to earth to experience this great supper? Because the Old Testament saints had to be raised in Daniel 12, verse 2, as well as the tribulation saints who gave their lives for the cause of Christ during that seven-year period, Revelation 20, verse 4, so they can also be at the great marriage feast. Now, as he comes with his bride, it's depicted in verses 11 onward. Oh, this is a magnificent scene. He comes on that white horse in verse 11. His bride is with him in verse 14. He comes as King of kings and Lord of lords, verse 16, to rule and reign for 1,000 years, and we, the bride, are right at his side during all that time. Now, there are those who really despise Christ, the world leader of the church, has turned them against Christ. You see, the spirit of Antichrist is to deny Christ's deity, virgin birth, blood atonement, bodily resurrection. 1 John 2, 18 says, Antichrist shall come. 1 John 2, 22 tells us what it is. Whosoever denies that Jesus is Christ, Jesus is God, is Antichrist. We find the same spirit in 1 John 4, verse 3, and 2 John, verse 7. They've apostatized. And this world religious leader head of all groups, has turned the world against Christ and anyone who worshiped this Christ, having them put to death. So now it's only logical that they turn against Christ as he makes his appearance on earth. And we find that in Revelation 19, verse 19. I saw the beast. Now remember, Revelation 13, 1, this was the leader of the new world order and the kings of the earth 
gathered together to make war against him that sat on the white horse. They say, we're not going to allow you to rule and reign over us. Well, of course, they're defeated. And as the chapter ends in verse 20, this beast and false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. It's over for them. And Christ is going to now set up a kingdom of happiness, joy, peace, tranquility, health, blessing for 1,000 years. By the way, this battle is also described in Psalm 2, verses 1 to 5. And remember, this is the repeat of Revelation 11, verse 15 to 18 when he comes. And the nations were angry, but he puts a stop to those who are destroying the earth, destroying one another. So 11, 18 and 19, verse 20 are in total agreement. Jack, I cannot imagine the arrogance of uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet and those who follow them, the arrogance that they have to say, you can't come to earth. That's God coming. And, and to think that they would think how powerful they are, that they could stop him. I, I can't imagine such arrogance. Well, in chapter 20, after the Lord does come, thank God, of course, they're defeated. The Antichrist and the false prophet are defeated. After Jesus comes to the earth, they're believers and they're unbelievers. He has to separate them. So chapter 20 speaks about that, Jack. This is interesting, Rexella. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 20, verse 2, when Christ comes, He binds Satan for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. That's so that when we, in verse 4, rule and reign with Him, there can be wonderful harmony throughout the earth. The culprit who's caused all the problems is bound. However, after the thousand years, he's loosed in verse 7. And this is unbelievable. A multitude that no man can number like the sand of the sea turns against Christ. Can you imagine after living in his presence for a thousand years, millions rebel and turn against him? These are the children, the grandchildren of the believers who went in to the millennium. They had human bodies. They could still bear children. And now, generations later, they hate Jesus Christ. The world has never loved our Lord. Well, immediately Jesus cast Satan into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, verse 10. Now, this is interesting because we have some cults today that say that hell is immediate annihilation. It's over in a second. But the beast and the false prophet are still there a thousand years later when this satanic power, Lucifer, Satan, is cast into that lake of fire. Now, after that comes the judgment day for all the world, all the sinners of all ages, and this is solemn. Oh, I hope you're ready to meet the Lord. From verses 11 to 15, we have what is called Judgment Day. I saw a great white throne, and him that sent out the Lord Jesus, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, pauper and president, Stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell, or Hades, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to his works. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, Gehenna. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Do you know there's a difference between Hades and Gehenna? Do you know there's a day when mankind is actually coming out of Hades, out of hell, to be judged and to be transferred to Gehenna? Oh, I'd love to deal with that, but I can't on just one video. 
We're almost at the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 21. It talks about a spectacular. And you know, friends, we're really living in some age today, a great advancement in science and knowledge and space. And now they're even talking about taking vacations in space and building cities in space. And can you imagine a city just hanging out there in space someday? Well, that's exactly what's going to happen. When the Lord returns, the holy city is going to hang out in space. And it must be absolutely beautiful, Jack. It must mm. be beautiful. Revelation 21, 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. There are those who tell us that when Christ comes, the world ends. Everything's going to be destroyed, and then he creates a new heaven and a new earth. I don't accept that. I one time believe that. Why? Christ spoke about the regeneration in Matthew 19, 28. And in Acts 3, 21, it talks about the restitution of all things. Now, I looked that up in Webster's Dictionary, and both terms mean renewal, a remodeling job. So, he is going to make a renewal. The world is never going to end. It's a world without end, Isaiah 45, 17, in Ephesians 3, 21. Unto God be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, the world without end. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But when Christ comes, not only does his bride come with him, but the holy city descends. Jesus said when he left, I go to prepare a place for you, John 14, verse 3. That's the holy city. And now John sees it descending from heaven. You know, we're going to build space cities. Ours go upward from the ground. God's comes downward from heaven. And it's recorded in Revelation 21 too. I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You know what a bride looks like on her wedding night? Well, he describes that beauty through the image of a bride. Now, you talk about beauty, nothing is more magnificent than what is described in verses 18 to 21. Listen. The building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the walls of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second a sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh a chrysolite, the eighth a beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophrase, the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Is it any wonder Paul, who had been caught up to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12, too, and had undoubtedly already witnessed what Christ had prepared, could say in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them. But then he adds, but God revealed them unto us, unto me, by his Spirit. And that was that great day when he saw the third heaven. I cannot even imagine. Can you exactly what the holy city will look like? Uh, but you know, there are a lot of people who are going to live there. It must be a huge, huge place. Jack, just how big, big is a holy city? Verse 16 says, The city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured it, and it was 12,000 furlongs in American figures. That's a city 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 15 1,500 miles high. Whoa, you talk about story upon story. It's yes. going to be big enough for all believers of all the ages, believe me. Chapter 22, and I love this chapter because it uh, talks about uh, the thrilling sights that we will see when we are in the New Jerusalem. It's kind of like a, a continuing sightseeing tour. And in this chapter, it speaks about not only the beauty, but the happiness, the good health, never any illness again, never any sadness again, all joy and blessing, because actually uh, we're with the Lord. And we can only have joy in his presence, mm, Jack. I love this chapter. 22, verse 1, he says, I saw a clear river of water of life proceeding out of the throne of God 
And on either side of the river was there a tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The literal Greek there is for the health of the nations, preventative medicine. It's going to be a time of real health, Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6. But here God says that natural herbs will be preventative medicine for the ages of ages to come. And of course, it's going to be a place of joy because verse 3 says there shall be no more curse. Verse 5, there shall be no night there, but the best part of all of it is, verse 4, they shall see his face. Now, Rex, I just want to conclude with this. The city will only hang there for the first thousand years. Revelation 21, 9 to 22, 15. Then, when God remodels, renovates, regenerates the heaven and the earth, it comes down to the earth in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 8. This is after the thousand years. And it's from that point onward that verse 4 becomes true. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, for the former things are passed away. This is life eternal on earth. Heaven has come down to earth. The tabernacle of God is with men. And as I've said so often, and you need to get my book, Millennium, Beginning or End, to discover the 120 texts proving this world will never end. First of all, remember, I say it one more time, we rule and reign with Christ a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 4. Then Christ is recommissioned in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28. And now we rule and reign with Him forever and ever, Revelation 22, 5. You've got two different texts there. One's for a thousand years, one is forever. Why? This is after the thousand years, after the remodeling of the earth. And you see, Christ comes to rule for the thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 4, but after He's recommissioned, He rules forever and ever. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. Not heaven, the earth. How long? Psalm 37, 29, the meek and righteous inherit the earth forever and forever because His throne... This is the Father speaking to His Son in Psalm 45, verse 6, and Hebrews 1, 8, when He says, Thy throne, O God, for Christ is God, is forever and ever. And that's why of His government there'll be no end here on earth, Isaiah 9, verse 7, and why He rules over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and of His kingdom there'll never be an end, Luke 1, 33. This is the story. This is the book of Revelation. Don't take it symbolically. We've proven today you can't. We've used the Old Testament. We've used Christ to prove that this is an authentic, genuine book. And oh, you need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Mm. You know, the final uh, message from my heart, as far as the book of Revelation is concerned, is that the Lord's going to return. There's just no doubt about it. The Lord is coming again. But until that time, we have to walk by faith, not by sight. And just look forward to the time when Jesus will return and set up His kingdom here on earth in peace and righteousness. No more unrighteousness then. It's going to be a wonderful time. But we need to prepare for the return of the Lord, Jack. Rexella, this is amazing. Revelation 21, 27 says, There shall in no wise enter into the holy city anything that defiles. But God wants you there. God loves you. So listen to how this book closes Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. And let him take of the water of life, Jesus Christ, freely. God wants to save you today. Do you want to be ready for the return of the Lord? To live on earth forever with him? Then please look at me. Call of your heart now and pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe your word. I believe you're coming soon to establish your kingdom. Lord Jesus, I want to be part of it. I want to live with you forever. 
on earth. I know that you died for me. There is no other way for me to be saved. You shed your blood for me to wash away my sin. This very moment, precious Savior, I ask you to come into my life, into my heart, and save me. I trust in the merits of your shed blood this very moment to wash away my sin. Do it for me, Lord. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Oh, my, what an unraveling of the book of Revelation you have seen today. And I trust that it has prompted you to pray that prayer with Jack. We don't have assurance of another day. You know, we could be taken out of this life any time. And we need to know that each day we're ready to meet the Lord. So if you prayed that prayer with Jack, please let us know, will you? Just write to us. I'd love to send you absolutely free a little booklet for steps in a new direction. It will help you in your walk with the Lord. You know we need the Lord in our lives to help us through our daily trials too. No matter what, the Lord will see you through and give you peace while we're here on earth. Let me just leave you with this thought. To improve your outlook, keep looking up. God bless you. Bye-bye.